Okay, well, hello everyone. And thank you so much for joining the recap of the early John Sepp think tank. We're delighted to have everyone joining us today uh, to hear a little bit about the work um, that happened before the event, of course, um, some of the information that was gathered, um, the work that led us to really thinking about developing the early John Sepp think tank, which happened last Friday. Uh, share some of the uh, findings, the agenda, the flow, and also where we're going in the direction in terms of helping convene uh, the research community, the medical community, um, with the fuel and the fire of the advocacy and the survivor community behind us to do this great work. Um, so I'm Andy Dwyer. I'm an advisor to fight colorectal cancer with the University of Colorado. I am delighted today to have all of you joining in, and I know that we still are having people uh, trickle in. So um, I'm just going to give a quick uh, overview of what we're going to be sharing today. Um, we'll hear from you all about who's joining us. We'll join um, in with a demographic slide, a little bit about the background of who you are. Um, we would also like to share, of course, the perspective from Dr. Jose Perea and I think Matt Young from the National Cancer Institute, uh, sharing the perspective of what really helped drive the work. We'll be having also an opportunity um, for myself to share a little bit about the agenda, the findings of the day, um, a little bit about the, uh, the experience that was, again, really shaping, um, I think, where we're going in terms of the patient response uh, related to early age onset colorectal cancer issues, and really the work that we need to really be um, setting forth in terms of helping respond to the needs of the community. We'll also hear um, from those who were really active and involved in our sessions, uh, the report out from the day, in terms of what were some of the key research findings, discussions, and again, what is doing that formative work to think about our next steps moving ahead. We'll get a chance to hear from Molly and um, about the policy perspective, as well as Danielle, um, a bit about the patient perspective, and again, what's driving our policy advocacy and patient education um, initiatives as we move forward. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time um, to hear about where we're going again in terms of directions, next steps. Um, and then Michelle Baker from Fight CRC's philanthropy team will be talking a little bit about really how did this work come to bear and a huge thank you to the contributions that made the research possible. So I just wanted to frame out a few things as we're talking about early age onset. Um, you know, this meeting is really to talk about uh, addressing the needs of the patient community um, who are characterized typically as people who are younger than 50 who've been diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And we know being diagnosed with colorectal cancer at this time in life has some exceptional critical challenges as it relates to families, fertility um, initiatives as it relates to work and what it means for people's livelihood moving forward. All of the colorectal cancer community needs are great, um, but we're particularly really honing in on what do we know about the needs of those who are young colorectal cancer survivors and thinking about what we need to do in terms of interventions to really thwart diagnosis moving forward, um, as well as research to hopefully um, really eliminate this, uh, this situation as it relates to a phenomenon that we, saw, we now call early age onset colorectal cancer. What we're gonna be talking about today is really critical because we're talking about driving the research really as it relates to what we're calling the causation, the exposure. And again, what are those interventions that we need to do to help early identify or even stop um, cancer from happening in this population. So we're really excited. Um, we're gonna share a little bit of the work um, that's really seminal to move this, um, the work moving ahead in terms of really thinking about opportunities but what I want to say is the think tank that we're uh, sharing today and what we're hearing from all of you is that we also need to be doing a lot of work as it relates to quality of life, survivor needs, as well as really thinking um, about the treatment side. So right now, and again, what we're talking about today is really focusing in on what we're calling the exposure etiology causation. But we're also going to be really talking um, in the future also about those interventions, survivorship needs, and then continuing to grow the work even from our last think tank uh, with Tempest Health in terms of really thinking about um, uh, exploring better treatment and treatment outcomes um, as we move ahead. So I'm really excited again to kick off today. Welcome all of you. Um, I am going to turn it over to my co-host, Dr. Jose Perea uh, from Spain, who's also going to share a little bit about some of the work that we've done um, internationally and a little bit about the direction um, and really kind of what led us to uh, to really kind of moving this direction, um, what, we, what we really were able to unpack um, last Friday as it relates to this early age onset think tank. So Jose, I will turn it over to you, sir. Yeah, the, the idea for the presentation, it, it is a very short presentation, and uh, the idea is uh, to, to share 
where we have been and where we are doing now because of the early onset colorectal cancer, why we are working together and why are we are working together. And the, the idea is, uh, of course, uh, early onset colorectal cancer is the, a, a very important problem of health, but uh, it's, it is not a problem uh, defined for limited uh, geographical areas, but it is a, a worldwide uh, problem. That's, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I was able to share it. So let me do it from the beginning here for you. And you just let me know when you need uh, media advance. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's, that's the point. So uh, we all know that this is a, a very well-known uh, slide and it is shared because of, uh, firstly, I think that the main uh, efforts that are, are doing are being done in, in early onset colorectal cancer is in the USA. And in the USA, it is calculated that uh, in 2030, uh, the amount of uh, early onset colon cancers will be uh, you see the, in the slides uh, and uh, an eleven percent of all colon cancers, and this is more uh, remarkable that rectal cancer in the in the young population will be more than twenty percent of all the cases of rectal cancer. So this is very a very huge problem. And next slide, please, Sandy. So the the point is that this is not a problem from the USA. It is a problem worldwide. You see in the, uh, on the slide, just very uh, summarize that uh, the problem in Europe is also a problem. The incidence, the incidence is growing. It's growing uh, in all, not in all countries, but almost in all countries. Next slide. And this is, a, and the next slide is uh, represent a, a, a map of, of the world. And you will see that uh, um, arise a, 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 a no. That's that one. So the problem of early onset colorectal cancer, one of the main uh, issues is that the, the incidence is rising, but it is not rising homogeneously. It is an heterogeneous problem. You see the in the red uh, color, all the all the countries that uh, the increase is so, so high. But uh, there are uh, some countries, as you can see in yellow, that uh, the increase uh, is high but not so so high as the others and then also surprisingly some some countries that have been studied in Europe as you can see in the in the green color are decreasing or not uh, rising the incidence so mm, there is a huge problem in the rising incidence but uh, the, one of the of the disparity uh, that arise on early onset total cancer is that this uh, this rising is not equal for for every every country next next slide please and not only that but also uh, specifically thinking about why do we have to focus on this problem is that together with that uh, that increase in incidence is that there are a lot of factors a lot of uh, issues involved uh, in this in this uh, area in this early onset colorectal cancer that should be sorted sort out so the need uh, of putting together efforts uh, internationally worldwide are absolutely completely uh, understood and and I think needed to to rise the, uh, to to find out the 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 solution of the problem please on the next slide all right Jose it's being a little finicky is this it yeah that's it okay cool uh, we, uh, we have we have two more so no problem so uh from the beginning, uh, uh, we separately uh, start uh, thinking about the problem. Uh, I was uh, invited uh, for this this first fight for rectal cancer early onset working meeting in in Denver, Colorado, in two, in 2019, and this was the first uh, meeting just focused specifically on early onset rectal cancer. In parallel. We also do this, did the same thing in, in Europe internationally, and it was in Madrid. We we hosted the first early onset colorectal cancer international symposium in in 2019 in the same year. Next slide. But finally, oh, of course, all the efforts converge and uh, early onset colorectal cancer international symposium hosted in in Europe, and also together with fat colorectal cancer, we put together those efforts, and now we are putting together those efforts worldwide to solve the, to solve or to try to find out which are the clues of this of this uh, important problem so that's it why we are doing and why we we may we develop uh, this last friday the think tank again to continue the uh, uh, studying the problem trying to find out which are the 
the weakness uh, to to reach and and all the all the problems that we should uh, develop in the future to find out the the clues of this of this early onset for erectile cancer. That's it. You want it? Great, right. thank you, Jose. And one of the things I want to mention is that this uh, collaboration last Friday um, was really with, of course, Jose um, and the work that will continue and the work we're building upon, but also with our partners from the National Cancer Institute, as well as uh, Vanderbilt University, that we had a great collaboration. I know Matt Young is on from the National Cancer Institute, so I was going to have Matt share a few words um, this morning also about the collaboration and our work um, together, but also I think a lot of the great work that the National Cancer Institute is supporting. So are we able to have Matt Young come off mute this morning? Yep. Yes, I'm off mute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, thank you all for, for inviting us in. Um, so Phil Dashner and I were there from NCI at the uh, Friday meeting. It was a fantastic meeting and I'm, I, I'm, it was uh, and we also had members from the uh, advocacy support group at the NCI. So, so this was a NCI interested meeting. Um, Phil Phil presented what the NCI is partnershiping with Fight CRC. We we have organized uh, workshops in the past together with Fight CRC, uh, both uh, at Fight CRC sites as well as at the NCI. Uh, we are in the process of organizing a, another workshop um, this summer or late fall uh, through the NCI and, and other uh, NIH institutes that have input into early onset. At this uh, recent meeting, we presented our funding opportunities that, that are available. Uh, and that will be shared with you later. So NCI is has funding opportunities that can be utilized for early onset colon cancer, uh, as well as other early onset cancers. Um, at, at the meeting, we also heard about funding opportunities from uh, the international funding opportunities, including the, the Cancer Grand Challenge, which is a cooperation with the UK and the NCI, and they have a, a funding opportunity specifically to early onset cancers. We heard from the Department of Defense and their funding mechanisms that, that uh, target colon cancer, uh, which could be applied for early onsets. And then we heard from the National Institutes of Environmental Health because uh, it's very likely that the environmental health is uh, actively driving, could actively be driving uh, early onset cancers. And so that's an important partnership to have uh, moving forward. So so that's our, our quick update from the NCI and well, free to take questions as we move on. Awesome. And Matt, I can't thank you and uh, Phil and also the office of the director for being engaged. I mean, this is really where so much of the funding and, and the energy comes uh, to help support this research. So thank you. And it's been a delight to partner with all of you um, throughout the years. Everyone, we're going to take a moment. Um, thank you for Dr. Young and Correa for joining us and doing the welcome this morning. But I think we also want to see who's in the crowd. So um, we're going to take a moment to go ahead and cue the poll. Um, so we want to understand today who's joining us in terms of based on um, uh, this is the patient uh, poll experience. But if we can get a little bit of the background um, about who's joining us today. So we will save this one for later. Um, but Brian and Zach, if we can cue the poll about who's joining us today, that would be super helpful if we can get that to work. If not, we can try it later in the show as well. Technology is always fun. It won't show for presenters, but it's there. Okay. So um, if we can have a bit of information about who's joining us today, and then Brian, will we be able to see that real time in terms of feedback or will we just be able to share that later? Both, I believe. Okay, great. Do we have most of the, we have most of everyone coming in or should we give it a, another minute? Uh, three of 41 at this point. Okay. Okay, we're seeing answers coming in real time. Okay, cool. 
That's great. That's great. Okay. Well, while we're getting that queued up, um, I'm going to go ahead and share a little bit again um, from the day. Um, and just, uh, Anirudh, I can see you uh, front and center. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides. Okay. All right. Right on. Okay, so everyone, I think Dr. Um, Perea and Dr. Young shared the perspective in terms of really what we were hoping and I've shared as well, but we were again, um, delighted to really host this in uh, Nashville with Vanderbilt, with NCI. Um, it was lovely where I think we got to on Friday here from uh, Jill McDonald, who's a stage four colorectal cancer survivor about the experiences um, that many folks face, uh, really talking about the need for research and um, really thinking about um, initially, like really what's going to charge from the patient community to ensure that we're doing the type of research that's going to be effective for the survivor community. And Dr. Kathy Ng and uh, Brittany and her team from Nashville also sharing about clinical um, interventions and specific clinics devoted to early age onset that are now blossoming all throughout the country and being responsive to really the needs and care. We we're really excited to have Dr. Becky Siegel um, and Sersek share some perspective as it relates to data and colorectal cancer. Um, and I think that as uh, Jose shared, understanding that you know that's a global phenomenon, but what we're seeing in different countries um, really is contextually somewhat different. So what do we know? What are we learning um, from ultimately the burden of colorectal cancer globally, but also knowing the incidence and burden can be a bit different uh, based on the geography. Um, we're really excited, and I think um, Dr. Young did a nice job of, of summarizing really what funding mechanisms were out here. But I think why I want to underscore is that FICRC really led an opportunity and a convening for these individuals all throughout the country, um, people internationally, to share some perspective about the research we'll, we'll share more about, but also really what are the opportunities and when of the funders uh, historically funded and what are some of the questions that are really relevant to the research community? So what I really loved about last Friday, it was an opportunity for people doing the work who published in the area who will have research moving forward really also paired with the funders in the room to talk a little bit about the perspective. And of course, it wasn't to bias. It wasn't to really make sure that we're, uh, we're being very careful about conflict of interest. But if we don't really start really thinking about convening, from industry, from science, from funding, from academic institutions um, and the like, I think that we'll continue to maybe be siloed in our research. So the idea would really be to open up these conversations so that we're really hearing from all people who are vested, including survivors and advocates about what are the needs for research, where we're going and the direction to really make this happen. So I wanna thank all of the funders who were there, um, everyone who shared perspective, but I really think the fuel for the day was of course really driven by the breakouts and hearing from many of the folks who are part of the research um, community who are sharing a little bit about the perspective. So we had a chance for Caitlin Murphy and Dr. Kathy Ng um, to understand and really help drive the moderation of what our first track, which was also uh, deemed the exposure uh, microbiome and really thinking about what is do we think might be causing colorectal cancer in such the young ages to have a phenomenal uptake in the last 15 to 20 years. We had Dr. Dean Jones, Cindy Sears, Mariana Bindalos, as well as Kit Curtis share some of those perspectives. And we're gonna share a little bit about what came out, but really I think as Phil and Matt had also pointed out and Matt mentioned is, you know, there can be something that's really based on the biology, but there might be many things that are working in tandem to really think about driving maybe some of the uh, issues related to exposures and really what's happening um, with people to really understand this opportunity and what's causing this opportunity for an increase in, in colorectal cancer. And then we had actually Dr. Uh, Dr. Dem, Dr. May, also then helping lead out the charge, talking about what are those interventions and what are the opportunities for research to understand how can we earlier detect or even find interventions to prevent early age onset. So we had Dr. Ann Zaber, Iris Ladin, uh, Vogelar out of um, the Netherlands, as well as Dr. Perea, Heather Hempel, um, really sharing the genetics, the risk stratification, as well as understanding more about the screening guidelines. And within the United States, as well as globally, what's happening with this idea of moving screening rates um, even lower than age 50, what are the lessons learned? Um, and we'll hear more about that from moving from 50 to 45 in the US. And what are some of those global trends and perspectives as well as Dr. Asma Shakut really sharing also um, some of the awesome opportunities for research moving forward in terms of triaging syndromes um, and signs and symptoms, but also understanding some of those emerging technologies that might help us early identify. 
So what I wanted to say from this day is that, you know, this is a lot of people, right? These are all the fo folks who joined in. They're survivors, there's advocates, there's business folks, there's people from pharmaceutical companies, from industry, there's doctors, there's researchers, there's people who are doctors who are also pleural cancer survivors who are in this crowd. We had an amazing mix of people from all walks of life, from all throughout the country, and even I think a handful of people internationally who joined us. But the idea is that we're gonna continue to grow this work. We'll share more about where we're going in direction, but really it's gonna take all of these folks as well as 10 times this group, including all of you to really continue our work moving ahead. Um, so I really just also wanna stress that Fight CRC has put a lot of uh, initiatives in terms of thinking about path to a cure. That's really then been focused on from understanding the biology and etiology, hence the track prevention and early detection, hence one of our tracks. And then also really thinking about um, stronger and more um, efficient and efficacious types of treatment, which again, we've been tackling over the last couple of years with one of the think tanks that was really the fuel and the engine to do part of the work with Tempest Health. That's really helping us think about the utilization of data, treatment outcomes, and understanding more about where we need to go in terms of drug development and understanding about treatment. And then, as I mentioned at the start, we really need to really spend some time in terms of survivorship and dedicated discussions about reoccurrence. And this is an area where we're going to be continuing more work in the next couple of years as we continue really the work that's happening with the think tanks from last Friday, what we're recapping today that help us with zone one and two, work that we've done already with zone three, but also then really launching some energy moving forward. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at the path to a cure, we'll send that link along where we talk about the build out of these objectives and the direction that we're going. But really the idea is that the think tanks, the work we're doing is built on a strategy with objectives and that we can really measure these outcomes and really tether to something that helps us as a Northern star as we move ahead. So we join, we ask all of you to join in with us. Um, there's hosting an annual dialogue, being a part of these discussions, uh, really thinking about measuring this work, putting the work into priorities, understanding what those priorities are and thinking how you can be a part of it, really think about stakeholder engagement and really how you can help drive things such as policy, which Molly will talk about, Michelle will talk about philanthropy. There's ways to really join in the work, whether that's through advocacy, whether that's through helping our research agenda move forward. We need all of us around the table. So I'm just going to quickly talk about a few of the wins that we've seen right now, but ultimately hosting December 1st and really our work with collaboration with NCI, with Nashville, with um, Vanderbilt, that was a really big win. We really need to continue this kind of work moving forward. And so that's one of the things that we're doing. And that's, of course, the guidepost was our path to a cure, but ultimately the no see and really helping um, give exposure to some of those funding mechanisms that NCI has available has been a huge win. And again, I think the advocacy community community really urging members of Congress, local, uh, national, federal partners to endorse this type of research is something that's huge. This think tank, as I mentioned, and the global work will continue. And then ultimately, even some of the manuscripts and some of the work that we're doing with many of those investigators who are pictured in that photo earlier, as well as many who aren't, really helping think about the red flag, uh, red flag signs and symptoms and what do we know about the patient community that we can bring awareness to the need for really thinking about early age onset within primary care, as well as that colorectal cancer is not just an older person's disease. It's something that we need to take really seriously moving forward. Fight CRC has been working with looking at the Genetic Counseling and Services Act, also really thinking about Lynch syndrome as a specific dedicated area where there needs to be fault, uh, further policy and advancement. And I think as part of Fight CRC's continued advocacy work, I think it's a reminder that even moving guidelines from 50 to 45, unless we continue this work and advocate, we won't necessarily see um, all of our, our efforts and really what we've implemented be fully um, endorsed if we don't continue to advocate. So I think the physician teams have really done a great job of really moving that, 40, that 50 to 45 in terms of really um, of keeping, but ultimately when the Amer American College of Physicians um, had some pushback, many of you in our advocacy community and policy group really pushed back and talked a little bit about what were the science as well as the need to keep the screening age at 45. And as I mentioned with Tempest Health, which is uh, one of the large partners that we work with who have access to a number of, uh, a number of uh, resources such as outcomes data, and also really thinking about a number of um, opportunities for understanding outcomes for uh, treatment. We've established a fantastic opportunity 
to have a postdoc really working with us for matchup data and outcomes with in demographic information, patient information to understand really where are we going with treatments and to make um, more impact in treatments moving forward. So again, when we saw those zooms one, two, three, and four, you can see fight CRC is really doing a great job of doing um, implementation in setting forth a plan, but also moving forward the direction. So one of the things I want to do today is also hear and share information that we heard from all of you. And so one of the things that we're going to share, and I can not take full credit, I think uh, Fong, I think Elizabeth uh, Fisher and Danielle and team from the patient ed group, as well as from the communications team, did a bang up job getting out information. And in a two work week span in October, we're able to gar garner results from over 900 individuals to ultimately learn um, what were the issues related to early age onset and what's your feedback about how a diagnosis has shaped or impacted your life. This was shared through various social media platforms and what we call a convenient sample or all comers were able to uh, really respond. But essentially the vantage point was from people who were survivors or caregivers, really what was happening related to a diagnosis. And again, how did the uh, diagnosis shape, shape the impact? So I think many of you who are in the crowd today are probably people who responded, but I'd like to share for those of you who are familiar with this poll, as well as people who were not, what we've heard. So in terms of really thinking for the patient community, we heard about gaslighting in terms of understanding and being really taken serious about a diagnosis. So 72% of people said they experienced some form of gaslighting or something where they weren't felt like they were taken seriously, or maybe that they were even felt like they were maybe not in the right mind for thinking something that was that was wrong. But my sister uh, was ga gaslit by doctors for months. She was pregnant and everything was blamed on that. Sadly, it was too late. By the time she was diagnosed, she was 36 years old. So we're going to be sharing some of the perspectives of what we heard, but 72% of those uh, who responded, of those 900, said that this is something that impacted them. Five CRC is really going to be spending a lot of time drilling down to these sort of um, issues and really thinking, how do we support you? Did you have insurance and what were the treatment um, impacts based on that? And so even though my mom had died from colon cancer, the response was I have a genetic predisposition, predispos predisposition and a pre malignant polyp removed. I have to battle every two years for coverage, 59% experienced an, an insurance issue. Um, have you experienced the myth that CRC is an older person's disease? 90% of those who responded said that this was the case for them. So the GI was still processing his shock of a 35 year old with no family history having colorectal cancer. So folks, these are the kind of things that we definitely need to consider those sort of outreach and awareness as we move forward. The question, did your diagnosis impact your education or career plans? 76% yes, they experienced an impact on education or career. One of the quotes, I had a partial colectomy on Tuesday and was submitting an assignment for a hospital bed on Wednesday. Um, and this is really something that we hear time and time again. I was cancer free in February and graduated in May. And so I just wanna say this also speaks to, I think the resiliency and really the determination of so many folks who are impacted. Did you experience changes in the body image due to treatments? 92% said yes, which I don't think is any surprise. Um, and a reminder that the scars and the cuts are there and there for life, and that's a huge impact. Did you receive adequate information about the potential long-term effects of treatment? Sadly, 16% said they felt that they were not prepared in terms of this. And nearly 10 years later, I experienced high blood pressure, glaucoma, glaucoma hearing loss, and neuropathy in my feet. Did you experience any cancer and career setbacks due to your diagnosis? Nearly 70% said yes, and that as a caregiver, you were reassigned due to frequent absences, local chemo, out-of-state medical trips, and an, a myriad of other issues. And so what I want to also remind folks is, of course, when we say survivor, we mean people who are impacted by chloroquine cancer, as well as those who are caregivers. And did you receive info about fertility preservation? 27% said yes, meaning that there was a whole lot of people who did not. Almost, um, almost 60, 70% um, who did not, actually closer to 70. My first opinion told me I didn't have time. And that leads then, of course, to then the discussion about accessing clinical trials or treatment. 58% face treatment and um, access to treatment issues, limited clinical trials, and no options for alternative therapies. And then challenges um, accessing, and this is something, again, that we had mentioned here. Do you have financial strain from treatment and follow-up care? Almost 80% said yes. I went back to work too soon and couldn't cope, so I lost my job. And did you have um, 
And I think we have a little bit of redundancy here. Um, and then ultimately thinking about the impact on relationships. Did your diagnosis impact your dating or relationship? And um, over 70% said yes. I did not feel fair to myself or someone else to take that with me or to fall in love, not knowing how long I would be here. And so everyone, I think these are the things that, of course, as we talk about the research, as we talk about the science today, it's really imperative that we really do think about the impact of those who are um, suffering and who've had a diagnosis from colorectal cancer as we really think about um, the individuals who we will be impacted by the work that we're doing. So with that, um, I did want to have a little bit of time, of course, to showcase this work. Uh, we will have this information available. Please share this by and large. Um, but I do want to hear a little bit from all of you uh, based on your experiences revealed in the poll. What are the things that were most surprising or un unexpected based on those poll results? So if you could spend a little bit of time sharing this feedback, that will be super helpful for us. And then we will continue on. But again, I think it's imperative that we do have uh, the patient community involved and engaged in all of our work. So please take this time um, to, to share. Okay, so Brian and team, I am going to stop sharing now um, and we'll have a little bit of time. Um, do we have the poll results? Um, if we can, uh, okay, so Zach shared, oh good, great. In the chat, we have a little bit of who's joining us today and we'll also share that perspective as well um, about what we hear from all of you based on these patient polling reports. Um, so with that, I think, um, Brian, we are ready um, to actually begin our report out in terms of our tracks and sessions, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. All right, great. So while I pull up, uh, I feel like I've been talking for a long time. Um, so I am going to pull up um, our slide presentation. And I told um, my esteemed colleague uh, that he would not have to say a few words. But Anirudh, I wonder um, if you don't mind coming off mute, just sharing a little bit of perspective um, from your first event as a Fight CRC um, a uh, junior faculty member who joined in and sharing a little bit about the day. Hi all, Hi all. I'm Anirudh Rathod. I'm a postdoc uh, at UD Southwestern Medical Center and I'm a physician and a molecular epidemiologist. So this was my first time at the fight CRC meeting and um, the, the awesome group that was over there uh, that was working for the uh, working towards the same goal of uh, uh, saving lives of uh, these young patients, of oncologists, of epidemiologists, from academia to industry, everyone working towards the same goal was uh, inspiring, as well as it was just an, oh my God, it's an awesome place to be at right now, that feeling from my side as a very early career investigator. Uh, the presenters that were there, they were really um at the top of their field, at the top of their knowledge, and the knowledge that they shared with everyone in the in the room was uh, really mm -hmm. something that we all were into it, and then we all were uh, finding that how we can move forward with that knowledge, and then how we can use that knowledge into uh, fighting against the colorectal cancer. So it was really a great experience, and uh, I hope to continue with the organization and hope to find a cure for this disease. Thank you, Ani Reid. We really appreciate you um, being there. And I just want to say, as I mentioned, Kathy Ng, uh, Dr. Caitlin Murphy, were both um, really the moderators. Uh, Caitlin has done a nice job of helping Anirudh and others make connection. And that's one of the things I also want to mention is that I think, you know, when we see the number of folks who are engaged, people who, um, like Dr. Murphy, uh, Dr. Ng, have done an amazing job of mentoring as well as really bringing people into this work. And I just can't thank um, those two ladies as well as many others who've been contributing this way, but also Anirudh, welcome to the party and we're never going to let you go. So I'm super excited about having you here. Um, but really for our track one, it was fantastic on Friday where we had Dr. Dean Jones from Emory University, who's well known in terms of understanding those environmental exposures and the work. Dr. Cindy Sears out of John Hopkins, who understands um, microbiome, not just from the colorectal cancer um, initiatives and really thinking about that sort of work, but also understanding the microbiome at large. Um, and then Mariana Bindelos, who's also new to our group, 
who has been doing a lot of great work as it relates to colorectal cancer in the microbiome, and Dr. Kit Curtis, who was doing um, a lot of great work with Samir Gupta and many of the researchers who um, we've had engaged. She's done a lot of work in other GI areas, um, but really thinking about applying her work um, as it relates to other lessons learned in other cancers is critical and mission critical to understanding about what's helping move this um, and understanding those key issues as it relates to uh, early age and set colorectal cancer. So I think, you know, as we talk about this work, um, we think about the external exposures that can be linked to internal uh, body burden, the biologic responses, and also measure of disease. We've been talking about oncology, is it, uh, exposome oncology is really to provide ca uh, capability to identify exposures and links to oncogenic mechanisms that are many times in the environment, maybe things that aren't just internal to the biology, but external. And we need uh, skill teams of exposome detectives to unravel really what we understand about um, early age onset and really what does it mean in terms of making these exposures for that internal, the biologic response, and then ultimately health outcomes. So in our case, colorectal cancer. A lot of the work that we um, really heard about was really thinking about that pro uh, the progress to prevention that we can discern um, strains, context, and ident identify the type of biomarkers um, that ultimately are the bacteria that can expose for a risk moving forward. So when we think about um, really the ultimately the idea of uh, microbiome, we're often talking about different types of single species or biofilms as they're called that really have that exposure in the gut. And they're really thinking about that that might be part of the reason that colon cancer and colorectal cancer is really um, starts to develop. And that some of that really might be to the E. coli that are considered a prime candidate for initiating this tumor development. And various studies right now are really thinking about how the colonization and how the polyp formation are really related to the polyp and the biofilms, and ultimately even understanding how C. difficile, as well as other types of um, exposures might really be considering tumor growth. And so these are part of the things that really are helping lead us, as well as part of the discussion that we heard um, from today or from Friday that are helping us think um, about this work. So hold on, I just have some things popping up on my screen to get them out of the way. So really the part of the question for track one was could disruption of that microbiome and the intestinal, the lining of the intestines really drive early age onset colorectal cancer? So one of the things that we really spent um, a good amount of time discussing were those environmental exposures, including high fat diets. So the diet being something that's external but ingested, and it can lead um, to a type of dysbiosis, which promotes ultimately um, uh, different types of uh, uh, blood vessel development, uh, loss of different types of cells dividing, as well as cell proliferation, maybe meaning cells can actually develop really erratically, and we can see different types of development happening that wouldn't be normal. When we think about those early life exposures that might contribute, um, those are later in life, they might um, really be things that are microbial metabolites, or even subsequent host and inflammation that might have early on, uh, we've been exposed to, but then cause in, uh, disruption later on in life and something like a colorectal cancer. So once again, little things moving on all over my screen. So I think we've got those all taken. And then part of the thing that was also discussed was really thinking about those aging markers and early age onset colorectal cancer. So from normal cells that require time, which mean their opportunities for screening, but ultimately, as we see this drift, we see a potential of biomarkers to identify risk for young individuals and create a window of opportunity for screening that population. So this is really something that we're calling that epigenetic uh, component. And areas for future research, including new models of chlorophyll cancer ev um, evolution that includes ultimately information about the tumor, as well as modeling um, the risk prediction and impact of bacterial exposures on mutations in younger people and younger birth cohorts. So ultimately, part of what was really discussed is on prevention, what, when, and who. So part of this can really be thinking of really how does cancer evolve based on data we have for mathematic modeling as well as data science. Can we understand more about the epidemiology and the development of cancer? So the four presenters who were there, we really saw some great information that was really sort of distilled down in what I've shared. But really in terms of the reoccurring themes across those is a multidimensional approach to require to understand early age onset. We understand that's uh, going to need to happen with high consideration for genetics, environmental exposures, um, ultimately also the microbial uh, factors. And every panel emphasized the need for collaboration, including sharing data, 
sample size modeling and research, as well as deeper communications amongst researchers, science, uh, scientists, and investigative teams. And future um, interventions will likely be tailored for individuals based on their exposures, microbiomes, epigenetic age, and also those risk factors. So I wanted to say that these, again, were many, uh, many of the highlights that were shared. But again, um, it really is about, I think, how all of these um, elements really drive this work. We know now that it's probably not just one single thing. It's really a combination of pieces. We will hear from track two a little bit about what were those reoccurring themes. But one of the things I want to stress is that we did have track one. We did have track two. But I think where we're moving in direction is understanding what are those themes and how do these uh, key findings from those specific tracks really drive the work um, together. So Anirudh, you were in that group. Um, I'd love to hear any other perspectives you'd like to share with the team before we punt to Dr. Carly King, who will be a doctor, I think, as of tomorrow when she defends her thesis, as well as Fong uh, from the Fight CRC team. But before we punt to Carly and Fong, uh, Anirudh, anything else you'd like to share? No, I think everything was really summed up and it was a great experience. Thank you. All right. That's awesome. So uh, another happy Fight CRC customer, but we're very excited to have you here. And everyone, again, as we get ready to move forward, we'll share more reports, we'll share more information, and we will also talk for the lay audience and people who might not have as much exposure to some of the science, some of those key themes moving forward. So Dr. King, um, I will pass to you and Fong. I know it's a little premature, but we are really banking um, on your thesis defense going swimmingly tomorrow. So Carly, take it over. Um, sure, everyone. So, hi, I'm Carly King. Um, I'm interning currently with Fight CRC um, in their research advocacy and patient education um, departments. Um, as Andy mentioned, um, my training's in basic science and the molecular mechanisms driving colorectal cancer. Um, but I really participated in track two, which looked at the research opportunities under the age of 50 for risk stratification and population based early intervention. So the different panels um, was really looking at the screening guidelines worldwide. How can we risk stratify um, the population? So how can we identify who is at low risk and who is at high risk? And one of um, those risk factors being a family history of colorectal cancer. And then what um, is kind of the up and coming technology as far as screening? So that being stool-based screening tools and emerging technologies. Um, so just to summarize, what I took away is kind of those key questions, key takeaways and opportunities. One being is what do we need to consider when evaluating screening guidelines, both domestically and globally? Um, a lot of that comes down to four, um, four main answers. How we address these answers um, is kind of still up in the air. So the question being who needs to be screened and how can we identify this population of who needs to be screened based on um, low risk or high risk, the intervals at which we screen. Um, which test is best? Um, so right now the gold standard, standard would be colonoscopy, but however, we know that there's emerging technologies surrounding stool-based screening um, and blood-based screening. So how can we start incorporating those into our screening guidelines? And then also the age to begin screening. So we know we moved um, the screening guidelines from age 50 to age 45 in the United States. Um, so kind of the discussion around that. Second is how do we develop a systemic um, way to collect family history? So as of right now, there's not um, a great system to collect family history. We rely a lot on um, our primary care physicians. So is there a way to educate primary care physicians to be asking these family history questions um, at every appointment? Um, one thing that stood out to me is how do we achieve 80% um, of adherence to um, colorectal cancer screenings in every country, in every state, in every neighborhood? And this is a very large opportunity for organizations and ad advocates to step in. So some of the ideas we came up with during this track was um, looking at health insurance and how can um, we advocate for health insurance for um, all different populations, um, looking at state-funded screening programs and how we can continue to get those funded, um, patient navigators, media coverage, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, as far as new and up and coming technologies, where do the stool and blood-based screening methods fit into our current screening guidelines? And then um, kind of integrating this back to track one, how do we integrate the microbiome, the exposome, epigenetics, and how can we integrate that into our screening and risk stratification strategies? And a lot of that comes down to um, using the data that we have available to us and then modeling that. I mean, I'm going to pass it over to Fong, um, and so she can give her perspectives on how, what she got from track two. Thanks, Carly. So I'm Fong Gallagher. I am the RATS manager for Fight Colorectal Cancer, and that is our research advocates program. Um, you know, I was really listening from 
a, a couple of vantage points where, um, you know, I was thinking, had my research advocate hat on as well as my patient hat on. Um, and it was really an interesting approach to hearing all the, um, the information being shared, especially as, as others have said, the caliber of, of people in the room. Um, you know, one of the things that I really heard was we lack the um, the information that we need in terms of having the the sufficient biospecimens. Um, you know, how do we create these registries? Um, you know, I for those of you who are patients, um, you may not be familiar, but there's a SEER database in the United States, and that's the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program. Um, and it provides information on cancer statistics. So that that is a source of information that we can draw in for, um, data from, but it doesn't have the actual um, you know, tumor specimens that, that we need to provide. Um, a lot of that comes through clinical trials and things like that, but how can we collectively um, put that in a unified registry where we have as much information as possible? So I, that, that's one opportunity that I saw. Um, EHR, um, electronic health records access, is something that I think has been a challenge for many of us. Some of us have access to these patient portals where others don't. Um, and the question is, you know, can we leverage things like that for collecting information like Carly was just talking about, you know, in terms of family history? And can we leverage that to um, expand to um, better alert? family members of uh, their screening um, and, and things that, that they really need to pay attention to. Um, secondly, the international collaboration I, I think this is a really big piece. Um, you know when when we're in the forum sometimes because of technology we can reach across to different countries and so um, a lot of what I'm seeing out there is that we have a uh, Sorry, sorry, that threw me for a second. Um, you know, we we have um, chances where, for example, um, Dr. Perea, myself, and one of our rats, um, Annie, um, actually put together a paper talking about the differences in the the uh, the the screening requirements and guidelines for early age onset. It's a lot more restrictive um, outside of the United States. Um, things like you have to have outside from first degree relatives with CRC, they must be under 50. Um, but, you know, when you're going through that one thing that struck me in Dr. Perea's presentation was that going by these standards, only 5% of them would be preventable. Um, so that's much higher here in the United States. So how can we align these things? Um, something as simple as definitions, right? What is defined as early age onset? Is it 50? Is it under 40? You know, there's, there's different things being used. Um, and then um, multiple multidisciplinary teams, you know, we, we've heard about the different things being shared. I think this is really huge because not only are we looking at just the researchers and advocates now, industry plays a huge role in this, not just with funding, but, you know, just realistically, what are the some, some of the challenges that they face and the perspectives that they can share. Um, so I think that is really important to tie everybody in, not just with discussions and meetings like our think tank, but really within the research, I think that this is a huge opportunity for us to bring everything together. So a couple, so a few questions that I came up with or comments, um, you know, what are the best ways to integrate patients in the research with minimal patient burden? Um, you know, we we talk about the financial toxicity. How, however, there's also time toxicity. You know, we think about how much time it takes for you to get to the hospital, wait for your appointments, come back. That's time away from work where you're where you may not be getting paid, um, depending on you know hourly or salary. It's time away from. Um, you know, your your jobs to where you're actually trying to build your career or school. Um, so there's a lot of burden on patients as we go through our treatments. How can we still engage our patients um, in, in, in a way that really minimally impacts the efforts, right? So um, and then how do we reconcile the inconsistencies of the definitions, data, and processes as we move forward in research, including internationally? Because, you know, again, you know, survivorship is, is another area where 
there are different terms um, and definitions for who constitutes as a survivor. Are you a survivor as soon as you're diagnosed or is it considered when you first complete your, your uh, initial treatments? You know, um, I've seen so many different things being used. Um, and then data availability, again, it, it can be a really big challenge. So how can we collaboratively work to ensure sufficient samples for our research, particular in, in subgroups? Um, you know, when we're talking about um, DEI, for example, a lot of a lot of us automatically assume that that is going to be race, ethnicity, cultural definitions, but it, it goes beyond that. You know, when you think about just geographic location, your your zip code can determine the access that you have, right? And the access, of course, determines uh, outcomes. And so I think that you know, just because you are of a certain race or ethnicity, that's not all of it. So I, I think that we need to consider what are the subgroups that we need to look at and how do we how do we work to have research that is meaningful for those subgroups when those um, sample sizes are so small? So we have to we have to address these groups, or we can't just say, "Well, it's a small population; we we can't worry about them." There's a bigger population here. There has to be a way for us to be able to address the the global bigger challenges, but at the same time, to look at some of the additional challenges that these subgroups face, um, and and how we can help them as well. Awesome, Fong. And I think um, these are really critical um, and key questions. Fong, um, and I know that Brian's going to be sharing some of the polls about who's joining today, but we also know there's a number of survivors and advocates who are joining. I mean, what would your advice to folks be in terms of like how to engage? Um, I'm guessing because people are here today, they're really interested in research. They're interested in how to take action and movement. I mean, as you said here, as someone who's part of the Fight CRC, team, but you're also first and foremost a patient and sharing that experience, what would your advice be for folks about how to engage and really to be really involved in this work? You know, I would start with with sharing your story. Um, you know, just sharing your story is the easiest way to advocate. And it, you know, you sometimes as patients, we we say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I don't have that information. I don't know. Um, but you know yourself, you know your bodies, you know your stories, share those stories because that perspective is really important. You know, sometimes we assume like, oh, it's 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 not a big deal or, you know, it's it's just this, it's just, that that flows in my head all, all the time, it's just. And then you have to step back and, and then as I share my story, doctors are like, oh, wait, you know, wait, can you back that up and, and explain that? So just sharing your story, but, um, you know, if you're looking to get involved, get engaged with your cancer center, um, you know, start talking to your, your doctors about the research that they might be doing. Are there any cl clinical trials um, that I might be able to help with? Is there a survivorship clinic that I can get involved with? Um, these are, these are just starting points, but also, don't underestimate advocacy organizations. Join us. Come, you know, online. You'll find a lot of resources, but you can also reach out to us. The RATS program is an amazing program to, to learn the fundamentals of how to, you know, all these, um, you know, how do I, how do I get involved, get um you, you have a lot of opportunities here as we share the research, as we share clinical trials, um, and as we partner with other organizations, um, as we increase these multidisciplinary um, approaches, I, I think those are huge opportunities for us to get people engaged. So just come join us, ask how you can get involved, and we're happy to, to put you where you are most comfortable and most impactful. Yeah, there's a place for everyone. Um, I know that Zach is going to be sharing information, and I saw um, information asking people who are from FQHCs, uh, clinic systems, who are in the community, um, get your information, patient education uh, materials exist. Danielle will be talking about those. Molly will be talking about advocacy opportunities um, as it relates to this work, but I know that there is questions in the chat about how to receive these materials, how to get engaged. Um, so there's something for everyone. And I really think that Fong, you've identified that and honestly embraced that. Um, one of the questions I do want to address, and I'd really love to see if there's any real time, there was a question about screening age. And the question is, is there any initiative or efforts to move that any lower than 45? 
I think Iris um, from the Netherlands did a fantastic job of sharing, you know, the the kind of the lessons learned, the impact. And I will say, by and large, I think unanimously people agree for the United States that moving from 50 to 45 was the right move. Uh, we feel like the trajectory is good. I think some of the questions were, would this mean a uh, loss of capacity for people who are over, over age 50, where risk overall might be um, larger, right, for the population because of age, that's not being seen, right? I think the curve in terms of the uptake, we still want that to continue from 50 to 45, or at least on time screening, no later than 50. So that's starting to happen. Um, but one of the things I think we also want to do is Becky Siegel from the American Cancer Society pointed out, right? We wanted to understand and we will keep a keen eye on what's going on with incidents related to all ages moving forward. And the, the bad news is really that it's kind of happening an increase in all ages still, right? And so those are the things that we're gonna still take into consideration globally as uh, Jose and others have talked about. This is something that all countries are really looking at. I think there's even some discussion about, you know, would we start earlier, but do screening less frequent? You know, there's a lot of different things, right? That are being really monitored right now but I want to remind everyone, you know, is that ultimately we have to have the data. We have to make sure that when we're putting something into implementation, it's best for population um, overall. But FICRC is a huge advocate of making sure that this data is really timely. Um, this is why I think what Fong and others mentioned that we have this infrastructure in place that we're able to capture data. That's information about screening, about incidents. It's about tumors for those diagnosed. It's about what happens for people for outcomes. This is a kind of data that drives science. So we're gonna be keeping a keen eye on this and what it means in terms of starting screening rates. The one thing though, everyone, I do wanna stress, and I think Dr. Siegel, um, Becky really stressed this, is that we also do know that for specific populations, even with starting at 45, we're not seeing the uptake. American Indians, Alaskan Natives, um, Hispanics, uh, blacks, white non-Hispanics, there's subpopulations all throughout the country who are not getting screening even with the current guidelines. And we need to really, really press upon where we're seeing the lower rates for people who already have a guideline in place that they haven't necessarily have access to that or they're not moving on it. And I think there's guidelines, of course, that exist for people who have a uh, family history or who are increased because of a genetic or familial syndrome. So Dr. Jose Perea has been a leader with this. Those exist. And so let's do diligence to get those people, our communities, everyone in. I mean, I have to press my own family and I have a you know history of colorectal cancer in my family, but many of my family members live in Eastern Colorado. It's a town of less than 800 people. And a lot of times nobody goes to the doctor unless something's really wrong. So we have to impress upon people, get screened. There are guidelines exist. But meanwhile, many of us are still continuing to watch that data, understand if and when we should move that guideline back in the U.S., be below 45, what it means internationally. So yes, this is a good question. Yes, we need to keep moving. Yes, we need to watch it. But there's a lot of work to be done to get people into screening while we do have um, some even some guidelines in place for people that aren't getting that access. So I can't stress that enough. Um, let me see if we have some additional questions coming in. Um, and so thanks out for the shout out for the paper, Annie. Um, and then I think we're going to have Brian go ahead and share some of those poll results as well. Um, so here's who's joining us today, patients and people identify as patients or survivors, both groups, just um, around 20 percent, caregivers, 15, blood relatives, a patient or survivor, 12, non-blood relative, uh, 9 percent. Policy professional uh, coming in at six, researcher at just under 20, physicians at about 10%, uh, nurses about 3%, people who identify as other medical providers, uh, 3%, public health professionals, woo woo, 20%, uh, industry partners, three, and 9% uh, uh, who actually identify as others. So a really nice mix of folks today, everybody, and we're super excited because I do think we have some international uh, perspective as well. Um, so, and then the question, there's a comment for the survey, it would be great to get info on those diagnosed in the last five years and more than five years ago to see if there's strides, um, especially regarding the gaslighting. So I couldn't agree more, the more we can learn about the population and the needs that will help drive us. Um, so I do wanna also just reinforce, we are gonna get as much information from the December 1st meeting, the polls that we're, uh, that we're driving this work coming into that meeting and what we're hearing today, use the information, um, get it out, utilize it as best you can. We'll provide citations, we'll provide access 
but information is power. So Fong, Carly, Anirudh, thank you a million. Um, also Aaron Derbos and many others who helped really um, plug away at the notes and getting us really to a good spot. So um, Miss um, Molly, I believe you are up next, correct? To share some perspective about the advocacy work? Great, yes, happy to. Um, hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, let me get this into presenting mode here. Um, but I am just going to talk a little bit about um, how advocacy and policy intersects with all of the great work um, that the research team has been doing and um, what's been happening in these think tanks. So um, advocacy is obviously a core part of what we do here at Fight CRC, um, and we really work um, hand in hand with our research team to make sure that we're doing what we can on the policy side to make sure that um, the research that um, they're talking about and working towards um, can come to fruition. So um, I wanted to just quickly highlight at a very high level some of what um, the folks from NCI presented um, last week. And I know that Matt and others from NCI are on the phone, so please feel free to, to jump in if there's anything I missed. But just at a high level to show um, you know, some of the projects that have been funded recently um, as it relates to colorectal cancer. So um, we even had um, Cynthia Sears was um, at the meeting last week. So um, again, just sort of showing how you know great the the group of folks um, in the room were, and and really kind of at the heart of what's happening around colorectal cancer. So this is just a snapshot of um, of what um, some of what the NCI has been doing. Um, let's see here. What do I advance? There we go. Um, and then also, um, this was something that Andy mentioned earlier, um, the no C, but really, again, sort of additionally highlighting um, and, and starting to, you know, solicit applications um, around early age onset colorectal cancer. So um, this is something that's live now. And again, another really exciting opportunity um, coming out of NCI. And so um, this was really, you know, there's not just one thing that we can point to in terms of, um, you know, why these things have happened. Obviously, we've had a really great relationship with the NCI over the past several years. They've been involved in um, our think tanks and the work that we've been doing around the research, um, but also from a policy perspective, um, uh, in the FY23 Labor, Health, and Human Services Appropriations Bill. So this is um, a fun federal funding bill that funds um, the Department of Health and Human Services along with some other agencies. Um, we developed what's called report language. So in those funding bills, there's line items for, you know, what the different agencies should be funding at, funded at, but there's also a section of those bills um, where members of Congress can basically state the sense of Congress. They can put in um, language to show what their priorities are, what they want to make sure that the agencies focus, focus on, um, and it's an important signal to um, federal agencies about what Congress cares about and to show that, um, you know, there's additional um, eyes and kind of looking to make sure that um, their priorities are being met. So we worked with our congressional champions to develop report language around colorectal cancer, um, directing the NCI to include an update in their 2024 congressional justification. So another kind of important budget document um, on opportunities around colorectal cancer, specifically opportunities to develop more effective therapeutics, um, rising rates um, in people under the age of 50, um, and the persistent health disparities in prevalence, screening, and outcome. So um, we were excited to have this included in the appropriations bill, um, and that's a real testament to our advocacy community. They re reached out to their mem members of Congress, they shared their stories, um, they urged them to, to support this language um, and really help to move this effort forward. Um, I also wanted to highlight, um, we were fortunate to, in addition to folks from NCI, also have a representative from the Department of Defense Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, or CDMRP. Um, so something that um, a lot of people may not realize is that the Department of Defense also conducts really important medical research um, that's really viewed as a, um, a complement to the work that um, the NCI and NIH are doing. 
Um, and so um, Julie was able to give an, an overview of the DOD peer-reviewed cancer research program. So within um, the congressionally directed medical research program, there are a number of different programs that guide the DOD's medical research. So many of those programs are disease specific. So there's a number of different cancer specific programs. There's a program dedicated to traumatic brain injury, to ALS, to a number of other different conditions. Um, but there's also kind of bucket programs. So um, one of those is the peer-reviewed cancer research program. So there's a number of different cancers that are eligible for research funding through this program. I believe last year it was a, um, around 20 different cancers. Colorectal cancer has been eligible for funding through this program um, almost since its inception. Um, and every year we have to advocate to ensure that colorectal cancer continues to be um, included. And, and this was something that was really um, a big priority of our founder, Nancy Roach, um, and something that she really helped um, to spearhead. So. Um, as I mentioned, colorectal cancer has been a topic area since um, fiscal year 2010. Um, and over um, the last decade or so, we've seen um, around $67 million um, toward, go towards colorectal cancer research grants um, for a total of 104 awards. Um, so while we're really grateful to have been a part um, and to be a part of the of the peer reviewed cancer research program um, for so many years and to see such great research come out of that program, we also really believe that it's important to for colorectal cancer as the second leading cause of cancer death for men and women as um, a cancer that's expected um, to be the number one cancer killer for those under the age of 50 by 2030. Um, we really believe that it's important that colorectal cancer has its own research program um, within the CDMRP. And so um, we have been advocating for $20 million to create a colorectal cancer research program. And we're continuing that advocacy um, this year as well. Um, and so we we really feel that having a you know a dedicated um research program that has its own dedicated funding its own strategic plan um is a really really key part of um helping to drive this research forward um so um as uh, I think Andy and others mentioned before, uh, I'll put in kind of a, a shameless plug for call on Congress and I believe Zach put a, a link to it in um uh, in the chat and, you know, maybe he can do that again, but um, in March, from March 10th to 12th, um, we will be gathering in Washington, D.C. for our annual Call on Congress advocacy event. This is where we bring advocates um, from all across the country um, to meet with their members of Congress, to share their story. We provide um, really meaningful advocacy training in the lead up. So if you're unsure about policy, if you feel like, oh, I, I don't know enough, I'm, I haven't thought about this since high grade civics or high, high school civics, um, it's it's no worries. We're, we have a virtual and in-person training component that will give you all of the tools that you need to be ready to have an, a successful and effective meeting with your members of Congress. So um, it's a really, really incredible event. And it's also just incredibly important. If we don't go to Capitol Hill to share our story and to educate members of Congress about colorectal cancer, about the patient experience, um, there's no one else that's going to do it for us. And there's, uh, as anyone who's watched the news, you know, there's many other issues that are um, taking up congressional bandwidth these days, um, but it's so important that we um, are there to remind members of Congress that more needs to be done um, to prioritize colorectal cancer. So um, we hope you'll join us in March, and if you can't join us, we'll always have virtual opportunities to engage um, as well as we push these issues forward. All right, awesome, Molly. Well, thank you so much. Um, and, you know, Molly, one of the things I want to mention, too, I, I think, you know, one of the things um, that we've shared a little bit about is, uh, and I'm hearing some, you know, some mention of family history, genetics, and the work. Um, you know, I, I do think you you stress, like, advocacy and call in Congress, um, but even, you know, with something that's coming up, like a sign-on letter, right, to urge um, uh, the CDC and others to include Lynch syndrome of something that's included as an ICD-10 code. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities um, do you want to share a little bit about sometimes like really how people can sign on for the things that drive the policy that make impact for research and care? Do you want to share um, a little further about some of those mechanisms as well? 
Sure. So um, obviously we have the in-person opportunity in March in Washington, D.C., but advocacy doesn't just happen one day a year. It happens all year round. Um, and so I would definitely encourage people to sign up to be an advocate. So um, uh, Zach, I hate to, to um, have you running around, but to, maybe you could put that in the chat or I, I can put it in later. But it's a great way to keep up to date on what's happening in the advocacy space and to be alerted of those opportunities that Andy mentioned. Um, as policy change and policy opportunities come up, we have um, a really um, easy to use action alert system. So you can just put your, um, uh, put your name and your address into our form. It'll directly connect you with your member of Congress and your senators. Um, and we've pre-populated, you know, the letter that you can send on whatever topic it may be. You're able to add your personal story. And actually now you're able to um, add a brief video, which is a really, um, I think, powerful thing, especially for members of Congress and um, particularly in this, this virtual environment. So we always have those types of opportunities Um for other folks on the phone who, um, you know, are um, with FQHCs or other local um, or state-based organizations, we also have opportunities um, for um, sign-on letters around different policy changes. So um, we've actually been in the process recently of working with um, the three main GI societies on a letter to the federal government them to remove out-of-pocket costs for patients um, who need surveillance colonoscopy. So folks who've um, had a polyp removed and now um, are on a more um, frequent um, interval for, for their screening colonoscopy. Um, so we've had the opportunity to um, have you know, organizations from across the country sign on to those efforts as well. So um, I, I'm also happy to put my email in the chat if you have any additional questions or um, are looking for additional opportunities to get involved, whether it's at the federal or state or local level, um, you know, we'd be happy to connect you. Thank you, Molly. And um, I just see a couple of comments also in the chat, um, you know, in terms of thinking about the follow-up colonoscopies, if you get a positive at home, um, kit for the non-invasive. So if it's a Cologuard, a stool-based test, a fit FOBT, um, FICRC really helped for the insured population get that coverage, really help advocate for that work. But I think the point is well taken about uninsured patients and really thinking so many um, people who don't have health insurance um, who are exceptionally vulnerable. So I know we've mentioned federally qualified health centers. I know we've mentioned the medically underserved at large. Um, and I just want to stress the point um, that this is an area where we need to do continued work. Um, and again, Fight CRC has been advocating for a lot of this work, um, Centers for Disease Control, and a lot of the work um, that uh, Molly and others have really been working towards their funding is really supposed to be helping support this population within states. Um, so if you do need access, federally qualified health centers, uh, comp cancer programs, your state cancer coalitions, um, oftentimes we'll be able to help link um, to resources and services. But I think holistically, I think the point is well taken that for uninsured patients, screening can still be very elusive and difficult. And that's something we're going to continue to advocate. Um, Molly, any final thoughts for that point or anything else? Um, I was actually just typing a response, but yeah, I, I would agree. I think that's definitely an area um, where more work needs to be done. We've um, been long advocating for the CDC's colorectal cancer control program to expand funding for that program to allow it to expand to additional states and additional communities. Um, but we've heard, of course, far and wide that that follow-up colonoscopy piece is um, a big challenge. We're also working at the um, state level through our Catalyst State-by-State -state Advocacy Program. Um, we just recently launched our new um, cohort of grantees. So um, we're working with folks in um, Hawaii, Missouri, Nevada, and Georgia. Um, and a few of those folks are working at the state level to create um, opportunities and programs for um, the un and underinsured to make sure that they receive that follow-up colonoscopy after a positive non-invasive test. So definitely still more work to be done, but something that we're working on and, and is definitely very much on our radar. Awesome. Thank you, Molly. And I know tireless work by many of you and results seen every day at the state level, but a lot of work to do. Um, so thank you so much. Brian is going to go ahead and I think if we can get our technology. Oh, my God, look at this rock star. Um, and so for the patient experience polls, based on the patient experiences revealed in the survey, identify what were the top three that were most um, surprising or unexpected. 
So changes in body image coming up at 35%, career setbacks, um, as well as facing challenges uh, for clinical trials, about 15%. Um, early diagnoses, or did you uh, diagnose imp impact your dating relationship? Um, the gaslighting coming up is looking like one of the top ones um, during that experience. And did you receive adequate information um, about the potential side effects? And then um, for some reason, I didn't get a chance, and I think it was my fault, in terms of that time toxicity related to treatments and the like. And so time toxicity really being delays, um, what does it mean for lost time? Um, is coming up as a term that I think really needs to be identified as well and the financial strain. So really great to have you guys as feedback at the beginning, but also then hearing again um, what we're coming up from you based on so many of your peers, colleagues, as well as really thinking about the communities you serve. So thank you um, for this as well. And so thinking of the patient experience and education and support um, and the great work, I'm going to pass to uh, Danielle Burgess, who's going to be also sharing a little bit further um, about her reflections on our meeting, as well as um, part of her work with Fight CRC to really engage um, the advocate and to help educate and provide the great resources. So, Ms. Danielle, I will punt to you. Hello. Thank you, Andy and team. Um, so I'm going to offer maybe a shift in voice. And I, I told Andy when... I joined, um, I'm going to boil it down because I am not a science um, speaker. So if I think there were about 40% of you are patient survivors, some of you are probably rats and you're keeping up, but if some of you feel a little lost, hopefully um, you can join me because I've been trying to keep up as, as much as you have. Um, I actually have a question, Andy, if it's okay, I have a question for you and Jose actually to just kind of kick this off um, that came up when I was listening. And my question was that, so kind of going back to this inter this idea, this is an international uh, effort and rates around the world are increasing. And with social media, we patients are talking to each other every day across the world. Um, you know, at Fight CRC, we're getting requests from Argentina, the UK, Spain is the country coming to our site the most uh, behind the U.S. We've got friends in Australia. So I think my question is in light of this being kind of a global phenomenon and knowing us patients are talking, what should we keep in mind as patients as we talk and share our stories? Um, like what is similar in countries, what's different in countries, and what's good for us to know even as we like dive into this world with the researchers? Jose, do you want to start? I've talked a lot. <laughs> yes, I, I I can add something. So that's an important uh, question, and there is a lot a lot of things that you can discuss about about that. But for example, mainly uh, now here we are uh, uh, me together with other researchers. We are uh, starting an, uh, a worldwide research, uh, specifically because we we know and we think about that. Early onset colorectal cancer maybe it's different uh, regarding geographical uh, sites. So that is not only a focus on incidents, because of course uh, it is different uh, if you compare all the statistics. But if you start thinking about uh, phenotypes, for example, it's completely different. We are now uh, we have already submitted a, a manuscript regarding that, uh, comparing different uh, countries in Europe, and uh, specifically when you compare. Northern Europe uh, with Southern Europe countries, the phenotypes are completely different. You you see in some of them more familial component. In in the other in the other part of the countries are sporadic cases. The the stages are diagnosed differently. So there is a lot of things. Uh, I I call them disparities on geographic sites, and this is very important. And of course, uh, connecting with patients. Uh, worries and everything like that, uh, I think it's, it is important to have a, a platform regarding a uh, lot of things. I mean, not, not only uh, asking for the problems, for the things that happens to patients uh, specifically, individually, but also for patients knowing that in each country there is there is uh, there are at least efforts uh, for trying to solve the problems 
and everything like that. It, it is an interesting point, and I think, for example, if I correct cancer could, that is leading this this uh, topic could also think about a platform that we can all of the, all of us involved because I think uh, putting together uh, uh, patients, uh, patients advocacy researchers, clinicians, that is a, a very very I think a, a, a very big effort, but the results will be more more reliable that we if we if we study the the, the problems individually in each country etc and just lastly uh, there is a problem about about the the screening strategies because uh, in for example in the USA you have a common point of view more or less but uh, for example an, an issue that I, I also uh, have connections with ties that is an, an advanced advocacy uh, association in Europe that is digestive cancers Europe and, and uh, they are trying to move forward in the European Union. The, the problem that if you if you analyze the screening programs uh, specifically on every country around Europe are completely different. You have some countries that the, the screening cutoff uh, age is 50. Uh, for example, do you think that Germany will be a, a very uh, mainly exact country about that but for example germany until recent years was 60 years uk so it's completely uh, the problem i think it's so 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 important that the effort i think could uh, should put together everything and try to move forward all together in that direction uh, i agree with with you daniel and Danielle, I think the one thing is, is like, I, I think um, Angie, um, Davis, you others have done a really nice job, Molly, engaging um, the advocacy community all throughout the globe, right? Because I think there have been a number of efforts, and that's something that we'll continue to do, is really ensure that as we um, move for the next iteration of this meeting, um, which, spoiler alert, it's going to be building off of track one, track two, and merging those to think about how do we grow this work. Um, around understanding about, again, that microbiome, the exposures in the environment, what's going on with food, and how does that really fit with the type of interventions we're doing and the kind of work that we're moving ahead. But that really is going to take an international push, right? And so the advocacy organizations really doing this work together to have streamlined policy, as Jose said, the platforms and that work. I think internationally, although we know some countries have higher incidence and lower globally, right? There's a trend and there's not something to say that those, what Jose showed the map, right? Those people who are green might be red in five years from now. And that's something I think might happen, right? If we're not careful, I think things that we do know, right? Is like uh, Fong said, sharing your story. That is absolutely, because awareness is still one of the big issues. I don't care where you live. Awareness is an issue from the provider community for the patient community, being a strong advocate, sharing your perspective, pushing, um, knowing that it's not in your head. Yeah, there might be a lot of other issues that could be related, but if you're in your gut, no pun intended, know something's up, continue to advocate, share that story, make sure people are not alone. But I also think that right now, part of the things that we can do is also talk to our family about risk, talk to our family about what it means to be screened. I know it might vary for guidelines, but then also getting tested and utilizing the screening. Those are the things internationally, I think that we can do. But I really do think that awareness that this is not necessarily just a flash in the pan, that this is still a global issue. Um, and even for countries, right, that are healthy and aren't maybe seeing that same uptick, you know, that doesn't mean the trend isn't going to stop. And, and I'll use the U.S. as an example. I live in Colorado. Colorado is supposed to be one of the healthiest states in the nation, right? And so I like, like we battle with Utah, but you know what? Our our body mass index is going up just like the rest of the country. We're just not as big as the rest of the country, maybe. We're seeing rates go up. So I think the thing is, is like we also have to really think about um, the, you know, diets of fruit, vegetables, exercise. I mean, these still have to be things that also have to really be considered. And I think we have to globally really be um, really, really thoughtful about what the research says about healthy, um, you know, healthy fats, healthy diets, 
movement. Um, these are the kind of things that I think we have to consider as well, because in some ways it goes back to the basics. Now there's some of it that we can't explain. Um, and that's where I think Jose is talking about doing part of this work and understanding those differences from the research and science. And that's where we need to have these platforms and like, but use your voice. That's something we can do internationally. And like you said, Danielle, by and large with social media, it is getting out, but even Fight CRC is seeing more and more international interest in the cause from different languages and the like. And I think the more we can be responsive to the communities, you know, the better that we will be as well. So that's what I would add as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys for that. I think I was, I was just thinking we we're talking about so much and, you know, research and what's happening in this country. And as we talk about patients, you know, we're talking about screening age and access to services and access to treatments. And so just remembering it's going to be different from country to country, but a lot of the things we're experiencing are, are similar. Um, and I just, I, as a patient perspective, I guess, kind of to, to offer that and just respond as somebody who does stay more in the story world, um, I think I feel so grateful to start out um, for people who aren't familiar with my story. I'm our chief storyteller here at Fight CRC, but I have been in this world for almost 23 years. In January, I was diagnosed with stage three um, colorectal cancer in 2001 as a 17-year-old. And I've currently, I have three notches on my belt. So I've, I've had it three times. My second two occurrences were stage one. And, um, I think that it is continuing to amaze me that events like this are happening because 20 years ago, I, um, was looked at as an anomaly and a unicorn. And so I think there's gratitude for fight CRC uh, for Jose, for your team, for every researcher on this call um, to hear that NCI is funding things um, specifically for this issue and that you see us as patients and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, for starters, just thank you on behalf of the patient community for this conversation and this work. And even if we don't always understand the intricacies of it, um, we'll keep pushing for it. And I think that's really important. When I'm gathering, you know, a bit, as far as track one and track two, Andy, I think you just reiterated a lot of it. And, you know, I think boiling it down to how I understand it is it's we're looking at our gut and we're looking at, um, you know, what are we eating? Is that causing it? Um, what's in our genes? And even as far as like what happened when we were in the womb, I know there's like embryotic stuff being looked at. So um, all of this is encouraging as far as, you know, looking at um, the why is this going on? I think a lot of us patients carry that question of the why. Um, and to respond with a story of why I think this is important and exciting work, especially when it comes to the research, is I actually thought I'd share a story. And uh, I remember it was right after my second diagnosis. So I was 25. And it kind of came out of nowhere again. We were really surprised. And I didn't yet know I carried a genetic syndrome. Um, I have Lynch syndrome, but I didn't know it yet. So I was on my second cancer and meeting with a genetic counselor. And that was my top question. Cause here I am 25 years old, having faced two colon cancers. And I was like, why? And I was asking him, I was like, what did I eat? Or is it where I live? And and I remember just feeling this um, shame in a way of I'm, what did I do to cause this? And I wasn't alone in that because as a young patient, my mom um, was also going, you know, what did I feed you? Know, what did I feed you? Oh, when, when you were a kid, I probably gave you too many frozen dinners. She said that one time, you know, I let you eat too much licorice or candy. And, you know, I'm here, I am 20 years old. And so my geneticist tried to temper my um, fears and kind of self-shame and like the self self stigma that came with that and helped me realize that, Danielle, there's probably environmental fact, like there's probably so many other factors going on um, that you don't know that led to this. But with you being in your 20s, it's the risk factors um, that tend to apply to older patients, obesity, smoking, like a lifetime of unhealthy habits. Um, may influence somewhat, but that's probably not what's going on here. So I've kind of been flashing back to that conversation that happened for me, you know, about eight or nine years ago and hearing the research and hearing that people are 
are trying to figure out the answer to that complicated question I asked my geneticist of why is this happening? And not only do I think it's life-saving, but it's also going to help, I think, the psychosocial help of patients um, because that is that we stand in the gap between the 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 research and the the science and the impact, like the polls. And that's what I was noticing is where, you know, track one and track two talk a lot about the science and the research. And then the polls are like, this is how it's affecting our daily lives, like our relationships. Um, we feel gaslit. It changed our careers. It impacted our degrees. Um, so just know patients, like I feel like this work is helping us be seen and um, hopefully this think tank and hopefully just learning more about the research is encouraging you because I know it's encouraged me in that way of I didn't realize the day I asked my genetic counselor why did I get this that the answers would lead to something like this event and this work but I've been um, really encouraged today and just the work we do at Fight CRC to see that side of it. And I want to learn more. Fong, you're my hero. <laughs> Fong and I are both survivors and Fong has a leg up on, on understanding this. But for other patients who maybe um, feel a little less, like Molly said, you don't remember civics class and policy. I do want you guys to know that there is still a place for you in Fight CRC. I'm very much that person. I came into this whole advocacy world through an organization called the Colon Club, and we've since merged with the Colon Club Fight CRC, and the Colon Club merged this year. And the Colon Club is a space um, for young adults uh, diagnosed with this disease. Fong was part of it, um, Carol on our team, she's part of it, and Carol and I help um, lead out kind of the future of Colon Club under Fight CRC right now, but the Colon Club taught me that I wasn't alone. And while 20 years ago, I was told I was one of the youngest in the country, maybe even the world, I quickly learned when I joined that group, that wasn't true. Um, and so the Colon Club helped me be part of this EAO community and find my voice. And that connected me with Fight CRC. And Fight CRC along the way has taught me um, not only how to share my voice and my story, but but the impact it makes on things like this. So I would say anybody, you know, any patients watching this or anybody like if you're in public health or social worker and you're working with patients to have them get involved and Fong was right, like just start by sharing your story and it will really make an impact, whether it's raising awareness with somebody else or influencing the, the congressional member to um, vote yes on getting extra funding into these programs. Um, it's really important. So we do a lot of patient ed and a lot of our goal is trying to help boil this stuff down for you. So what I'll say in light of all of this, if you're already kind of into the research and policy stuff, we've got a lot ready for you to dive in. And if you're still trying to understand um, words like epigenetics or biomarkers or understand clinical trials, Andy knows my favorite word is modalities. Um, <laughs> so if you're still like trying to understand some of this talk, we've got a lot of resources for you. Um, especially on biomarkers and clinical trials to really, if you're starting at the ground level, um, we've got quite a bit of stuff to help you understand. So I just um, thank, thank you guys again, uh, invite all patients to, um, to join me in this because um, it is for you, um, whether you realize it or not. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. And I think you're exactly right. Um, and I think it's awesome to hear, I mean, your journey um, and really what you've been able to accomplish in terms of engaging the community and telling your story. And you do an amazing job of doing that. So thank you um, so much for, for the great work. And I just want to also say for a lot of the patient education materials for the opportunities Danielle is leading up, they're sensational. And I know Zach has shared um, an opportunity about how to engage, but everything from meetups to materials to dispense um, to, you know, mashups with researchers. So Dr. Kathy Ng was sharing a perspective about a new treatment with Danielle and getting that really broken down. So Danielle, thank you so much for all of the great work and also the linkages with so many uh, communities all throughout the colorectal cancer ecosystem of sort. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Baker, who also is going to share a little bit about the resources of Fight CRC related to the think tank, a little bit of the work we're driving, what we mean by convening research and the resources to share um, really the propelling of a lot of what we heard today. So that giant picture of everyone really together um, really took resources and dedication from so many team members 
I don't know that everyone always understands all of the great work that Michelle and her team do from the philanthropic um, aspect and how they really engage the community to make these things happen. So Ms. Michelle, I will turn it over to you and thank you again, Danielle. Great. Hi everyone, thank you so much, um, Andy. I am Michelle Baker. I am Vice President of Philanthropy with Fight Colorectal Cancer. And I have been around the organization for close to 15 years. So I've seen a lot of the evolution and um, the impact of our research efforts that it's done for our community. I'm just so really appreciative of the work that Andy and her team and um, does and our patient education team um, and the researchers that make all of this happen. So thank you all so much for all of your efforts. I'm going to share my screen. Just one moment. All right, so a little bit what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, you know, how we fund the path to a cure in all of our efforts. And so I have the great pleasure of working with um, wonderful donors and our partners to fund the think tanks. And I think, you know, when we came out with the Path to a Cure report, it really ignited and excited our donors. They really wanted to be a part of this effort and bringing um, all of this incredible work together. And so mainly our Path to a Cure think tanks are funded by our donors. We've had a, a a uh, board member who has funded the previous think tank. And this year we were able to work with an ENSCO fam the ENSCO family to fund this early age onset think tank um, in which they founded a nonprofit organization, the 317 Foundation after their uh, wife and mother passed away from colon cancer, Michelle ENSCO. And she was a tough cookie. She uh, you know, worked with us when and participated in Climb for a Cure and raised a lot of money and was really interested in making sure that her funds that she raised uh, went to our research efforts. And so when again, we came out with the Path to a Cure report and the opportunity to host these awesome think tanks in, in various communities, they we spoke with Jeff Ensko and we talked with him about what we wanted to do and what we were trying to accomplish. And he was really excited and really helped fund um, really was our main funder of this early age onset um, think tank that we just had in Nashville. And so it's been a really great pleasure to work with him and his family um, to fund these efforts. But in addition to our donors who, who fund these efforts, we also work with our incredible partners and sponsors who you know help with Wi-Fi, scholarships for our research advocates. Um, you know, this webinar is sponsored by um, our sponsors and we'll be also coming out with a post think tank summary that we'll be able to share with everyone. And so really a shout out to the ENSCO family, Mark, Agenis, and Sejan for their support and throughout this um, Path to a Cure think tank. When I started as an advocate, you know, over 15 years ago, it really, I, Fight CRC really opened my eyes and broadened my thoughts in terms of research and what we were able to do. Um, and so I was really impressed by all of everything that we were embarking on um, and really what research means in terms of our organization. And I think one of the, the, the top areas that I was really impressed by was how we convene experts. I think years and years ago, when you had researchers doing their research, they really held their information really close to their chest. But now we are providing an opportunity for people to come together, share their knowledge, collaborate, talk about patient advocacy and the important work that we do, talk about our policy discussions and how we can increase, um, you know, increase in screening and, and research around our policy efforts. Innovation and technology is really important important. And just it allows us to really look at different research opportunities. And then expanding on those research opportunities allows us to look at how we can fund different research grants, re different research grants and different research fellows. Um, to date, Fight CRC has, has granted over a million dollars in research support. Um, and all of these grants that we give out, they support late stage colorectal cancer. And these grants are all made possible by generous donations from our donors. So when you look at all of our research efforts, mainly these are efforts that are provided from donations from our community. Um, when you donate to Fight CRC, 100 to our research program, 100% of your donations go to all of these efforts that I'm speaking about. Um, you've heard about our research advocates training and support program. We affectionately call our RATS. Um, this was a program that has been around Fight CRC since we were founded. Our, our um, founder, Nancy Rose, was really savvy and forward 
forward facing in her thinking in terms of patient perspective um, and expertise needed to be at the table with our industry partners, the FDA, um, DOD peer review, cancer research programs, and state coalitions. And so we work with our partners um, to have to give our rats an opportunity to really give their expertise um, and, and, and help amplify their efforts in terms of getting patient perspective. Um, clinical trial education. We do a lot around clinical trial education because that's also part of our research eff efforts. We want our community to know, you know, understanding the clinical trial process is an important aspect of treatment decisions. Um, and we want to make sure that newly diagnosed individuals have a better understanding of the right time to explore um, clinical trials and how to explore clinical trials. We all know that um, searching for a clinical trial can be very stressful for a newly diagnosed patient. So we want to ease the minds in terms of how you can go and look for a clinical trial, making sure um, that that information is readily available to our community. Um, and lastly, a lot of what we do around research is publishing research. Um, Andy and team and our patient education team um, have done a lot of publications over the years. Um, during COVID, we did a publication around COVID effects of the CRC community, um, precision med medicine, survivorship, and early age onset as well. And lastly, I know, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, how can you get involved? How can you become more a part of our research efforts within our organization? Um, I would definitely encourage anyone who is looking to um, become a research advocate, apply. Apply now. I believe Fong dropped in the link um, that for the, our application process that is going on currently right now. So we welcome you to apply for that. We need you. We need patient perspective at the table at every single point. Um, so definitely look up that um, application and apply. And if you may not know, think that you would be wanted to, to be a part of the research advocate program, send it on to, to your family, friends, or anyone who may be interested. Um, donate to research. Um, a lot of the efforts that I talked about, that is 100% funded by all of our donors. And so our, our clinical trials finder is um, specifically uh, funded by, by donors just like you. So please donate to our research efforts. And then lastly, you've heard us talk about um, all of the incredible resources that we have. Share, share this webinar, share our patient education resources, and then also join us in DC for Call on Congress. And that is it for me. Thanks, awesome. everyone. Thank you, Michelle. And I um, do think the power of convening um, is something that I have seen Fight CRC do amazing things. And I do think from advocates, from researchers, from the medical community, even after Friday, I think the notes that I was getting by and large is the science was outstanding. It was great. And it was an opportunity. But moreover, it was amazing to be able to connect and to provide this opportunity um, for people to make these linkages and really share about the science and the work and understanding that impact. Um, so thank you, Michelle, for driving that, because I don't think um, there's anyone better for steering the mission that really helps drive the support based on all the, the family connections, um, the impact on your family, but also then really talking about earning those resources. Um, so a million thanks for all the great work. Um, and let me make sure we don't have any uh, other questions. Thank you so much. That was from the comments. So thank you so much for that great um, uh, perspective. Anything else, Michelle, before we close out today? I think you came off can camera. So the answer is no. <laughs> We're good to Sorry, go. Sorry, I had a little tickle in my throat. No, I just want to say thank you all for the incredible work that you have done um, in pushing all of this research efforts forward. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I know Michelle's been getting over a cold and many of us are fighting these sort of illnesses. So just a quick reminder. So wash hands, make sure to take care of yourself during this period of time and masks can be very helpful. So um, quick, um, uh, as we round out today, um, I'll have Dr. Uh, Perea join me as well. Um, and I just wanna say, we're gonna share a little bit of insight. I think Jose's perspective about the international work we're moving forward. Um, we will actually be meeting and convening again um, to build off the work that happened last Friday in Nashville. That will be happening um, in June, late June of this year, where there will be a virtual international discussion um, about the context of developing these research. What are the key themes? Um, what are some of the things that we're hearing from funders 
from the community at large driving that policy. And we'll be having this discussion um, on an international scale. And then about a year from now, um, or actually in July of 2025, really talking hopefully about strong implementation of the work as it relates to research initiatives, um, maybe protocols, maybe some infrastructure that we've talked about to really, really drive home a lot of the ideas um, that we're moving forward. And one of the things I want to say about the research is I think one of the things that we're really trying to do is not recreate the wheel. We were starting to notice, I think, that there was a lot of stagnation. A lot of the research proposals and call for funding were looking the same. Uh, a lot of the science that people were doing the same. Really, our idea is to think out of the box. Kit Curtis, who's been doing work in other types of cancer, what has she learned that can be um, applied uh, to colorectal cancer? What's the breast cancer community and what are they learning? Because there is also early age onset incidents and uptick within that group. What are we learning? We want to make sure and blend this, you know, from the lessons learned, get out of that box, open it up, make some great um, opportunities. So that June meeting coming up, as well as the July meeting, is really to help continue this. Nothing will get solved in one meeting. We have to continue to move after it. And so that's why we're really, really interested in that international perspective and the growth moving forward. I will give Dr. Perea the last word as we talk about that international perspective. And again, urge all of you with those links that were shared, information was shared today, everyone has something to contribute to this work. Join us, we need you. Jose, I will turn it over to you for the final discussion about how this is shaping us internationally and um, as you see it for future direction. So Dr. Perea, take it away. So thank you, Andy. Um, I, I think one of, one of the points that you have uh, already said is completely interesting and essential. I think uh, there is not only early onset colorectal cancer rising, but uh, other type of cancers, not only breast, but also a lot of uh, GI cancers that are uh, arising, for example, pancreas, for example, appendiceal. So I think we have uh, to put together all those type of cancers and see what's going on, not only commonly uh, within the, the, the early ages, but also compare with late onset and see what are the differences, because if there is an increase not only from uh, colon cancer, but also for the others. I think this uh, specific uh, specific uh, influences, specific uh, uh, factors uh, could be some some of them in common. So studying uh, not only colon cancer, but also the others could uh, also uh, help us to to find out some some answers to the problem. So finally, uh, the, in conclusion, I think uh, we have already done, uh, said uh, all of us. Uh, much it is much uh, uh, already done last few years, but I think uh, there is much more to be done. So uh, I think this this may, should make us uh, necessary to carry out the next step. And you have already told uh, in that regard, and uh, Andy, that we are going to to make uh, different meetings, different uh, international meetings to develop all the not only the the previous ideas, but also to see what, what, what can we do uh, from new approaches. So uh, there are two next uh, dates that uh, we all should keep in mind. Uh, next June, we are going to develop the, uh, the next international symposium focus on early onset colorectal cancer. That one will be uh, online. Uh, and the idea, of course, as always, we, we are going to put together patients, patients advocacy, clinicians, and researchers uh, to make updates and, and also to, to try to develop new approaches in, in that regard. And also keep in mind that this is a, on, this online meeting is on, on 2024, but also we will have hopefully in 2025 in, in Barcelona, cross fingers, that we are going to have a, an, an the, the in-person, finally the in-person international meeting focus on, on early onset coronal cancer and hopefully and during these two years, we will move forward to, with too many uh, findings just to see that we are winning against the early onset colorectal cancer. So that's that's it. Uh, and again, from my part, uh, thank you so much to Fight Colorectal Cancer for helping and to, to be involved in all this effort, specifically in early onset colorectal cancer, and of course, inviting me uh, to this and to all these, these efforts. Thank you, Jose. Um, and Brian is keeping me honest, and I want to say a huge thanks to Brian and to Zach. Um, we will actually end today with a poll from all of you in terms of understanding the research priorities. So 
I think we've lost five people or so, but please let us know if you had to ca categorize the priority for research of the following early age onset topics, what would they be? And so these were some of the questions that we also asked during the meeting. So uh, gut microbiome, life exposures. So again, those exposures over the period of time, Danielle talked about that, I talked about that, maybe as a kiddo that you had and how that impacted novel biomarkers. So what are those blood, what are those tissue that might be causing treatment of metastatic disease, early detection, genetics, quality of life. Um, so please everybody spend a little bit of time for doing this because um, we'd like to interject this in part of the work that we're doing and we'll get that together because we'd really, um, as we close this again, your, your input is critical. Um, we'll make sure and to use this as well. And I just wanna say again, Dr. Perea has been a guiding force. He is really doing this at the national and international level. Um, the man makes round trip air, <laughs> airline uh, tickets to join us for just even sometimes 12 to 15 hours and then continues his work as a colorectal cancer surgeon back in Europe. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and share this information um, when we are concluding um, today. Um, so I, about 11 of 30 of you have present, uh, have shared perspective, uh, but really wanting to know again, what are those um, critical high priority, somewhat of a priority and low priority or not an immediate priority um, perspective from all of you. So um, we're gonna go ahead and close down shortly, but we'll leave the poll open. And um, Brian, I went to apologize because I got a little ahead of myself, making sure um, that we uh, got all of our presenters today. Um, but we would really, really love um, some perspective from all of you. And everyone have a, span, uh, a really great rest of your day. Um, join us, follow along, a million opportunities presented today. Um, and I really thank you. And again, thank you to Brian Thomas, to Zach, um, also who was joining us, as well as many of the people who made today and December 1st happen. Good luck for tomorrow for Carly um, and her thesis defense. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and super excited to see all of you in the future. Have a good one.